evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. We're taking a short break from the series that we've begun on revolution as religion. And I've been wanting to do a show for some time now dealing with the subject of children. There was an article in the Salt Lake Tribune back on July 23rd of this year talking about the 30th anniversary of uh, the pill and how Christian views had changed during that time. And it pointed out that there was a new book out by a Mr. Hodge called The Christian Case Against Contraception. And Mr. Hodge is a uh, member of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Pennsylvania, which is the denomination that we're part of. That discussion, which tried to incorporate views from both sides, was something that elicited a great deal of discussion on the Salt Lake Tribune's website. Much of it very heated, very nasty, almost all of it against the idea that Christians should uh, view uh, children as a blessing and something that we should, should long to have a great many of if the Lord provides. The views that were expressed there, uh, many of them are unrepeatable in the air. Uh, there was descriptions of women as brood mares. Uh, there, was, there were arguments that Christianity should be outlawed and that this was a sin against all of humanity. It was unthinkable. And I wanted to deal with that. How should we view children? Now, one of the things that kept coming up was that this man should have kept his mouth shut. He should have had no opinion because he wasn't a woman. And only women can have a valid opinion on how many children uh, they should have. And so I have brought a woman on to the show, a member of the same Orthodox Presbyterian Church, member of our local congregation, uh, Desiree Housham. She's been with us before, and we welcome you back. Thank you. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at what the Bible says, but let me just start off with, with the obvious. Uh, you, you have five children. Do. Uh, do you feel like a brood mare? No. <laughs> I don't. I think that's ridiculous. It's, it's a wonderful life. It's, it's just each of them are wonderful, and all of them together are wonderful. But aren't you being crushed under the, the, the cruel dictatorship of your husband? It was something that we decided together, and... I don't, I don't think either one of us wants them more than the other one does. We both, we both want them. But I mean, if, if you actually, you must be mentally deficient, right? Uh, you, you, you never graduated high school or, or much less pursued any kind of college, right? I graduated from college. You're a college graduate? I am. Didn't they teach you that all educated people should only want one boy and one girl just, you know, to, to carry on? Uh, the the race, so to speak. And I, I think I did hear that somewhere along the way. <laughs> so so did uh, did they make you feel selfish for wanting more children? Um, well, I don't know so much as at college in particular, but that's certainly that's certainly something you get a lot. But now you disagree with that idea. Well, of course I do. It, it actually it seems it, it seems kind of funny to me when people talk about you know it's so selfish to have so many children. It's not. It's hard to have kids. It's wonderful to have kids, but it's hard to have kids. And I always, especially when I'm pregnant, I kind of laugh and say, like, you know, if I was being selfish, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure this is the road I'd go down. I, I love them to pieces, but it's a hard road. It amazes me that, you know, d different people can have different motivations, and I'm not trying to guilt trip uh, people who um, may choose differently. But we're going to look at what the Bible actually says. And, uh, but I hear this cliche all the time that if you want to have a large family, it, it's from selfishness. Uh, when you're caring, you, you actually homeschool your children, don't you? Yeah. <clears throat> How can anyone call taking care of children, teaching them, spending m almost all your waking time dealing with your children, how is that selfish? I mean, it seems to be that it's the, it's, they've turned the world upside down because selfishness is better displayed. I'm not I'm, I, um, 
people have different circumstances, but the professional family who has a nanny take care of their children for them, or uh, they, they send them off to daycare or something like this because they don't want to be bothered with them. They want to pursue their career. They want to uh, pursue self-actualization. They want to uh, enjoy themselves. That seems to be more selfish than what you do. Uh, am I, am I, mis I can't have an opinion because I'm a man. <laughs> I think you can have a very valid opinion, but you know, and I, I don't like to accuse people of motives. But I, I know that when I, when I wake up in the morning and I know I've got, I've got a big day ahead. I, one thing that I'm thankful for is that this is an opportunity for me to lay down my life. You know, in the way that we're called to do. I can, I lay down my life for my family every day. That's what being a mom is. I'll, I'll, I'll throw something at you here. You have seen sort of the breadth of, of evangelicalism. There are people who would tell you that why are you bringing children into a world when uh, it's such an evil world? How, um, you know, one way the church grows for one thing is to have, you know, to have more Christians. If we have an evil world, it's because there's evil people in it. And to have, to have more Christians being brought into the world is a good thing. And Besides from that, you know, we're going to look at the Bible here in a minute. If we believe that God says that children are a blessing and we are to desire children and rejoice in having the children that God gives us, that's answer enough for me whether I, you know, understand all of those things or not. How about the idea that um, some people would have within evangelicalism that you should have at most one child of your own and then you should spend the rest of your time out soul winning? Do you feel like you're actually uh, following the Great Commission in what you're doing? I do, and I, um, my memory is terrible, so I can't remember who I'm quoting, but, but someone um, said, and maybe, maybe it was Luther, said that how can it be a large thing to be one thing to many people, like being a teacher, but be a small thing to be everything to a few people, as in you know, being a parent? I, 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 it never ceases to amaze me that with people who are more socially liberal, they seem to love humanity but can't stand individuals. They, they love children but, but often they choose not to have them because they want, they want to have control over them but they don't want the responsibility of them. Um, I meant to, uh, it slipped up on me. I, I actually had prepared a, a different show for this evening and uh, I forgot that you were coming tonight rather than, than later. Uh, so I'm having to shift gears here a little bit. But um, I, I meant to have the actual statistic uh, looked up. I believe it was either Wellesley or um, Radcliffe, uh, Eastern Establishment Schools. They did a study about 20 years ago of 400 women graduates that were all basically past childbearing age. Of those 400 uh, East Coast, w generally very well-off financial, uh, financially women, there were only 200 children. They, and if they had husbands, um, they didn't even, they didn't even reproduce themselves a quarter of the way. And so it's, um, the future really belongs to those who have children and raise them. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, I want to look a little bit at what the Psalms say, uh, what God's Word says about uh, children. Uh, we're not getting a feed here on our, um, on our um, monitor, so I'm not sure what you're seeing on your, on your screens there. But Psalm 127, verses 3 and following says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And then the very next psalm says, uh, Blessed is the one that feareth the Lord, that walketh in His ways, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. 
Behold, that thus shall the man uh, shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. We see over and over in Scripture, I mean, these are just two examples, that fruitfulness is a blessing from God. When, when He creates Adam and Eve, He tells them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And after the flood, once again, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And yet, the popular opinion seems to be that children are not an asset, but a liability. Um, now, your children are young, but what, what have you observed among those who have taken this biblical view that children are a blessing and, and happy is the one who, who has uh, his quiver filled with children? It just, you know, it looks to me, you know, as I look at families who are further down the road, that that's such a full life that, you know, there's there's the siblings that have the close relationships with each other and that have relationships with the, the older and the younger and then when grandchildren come along. It's just there's there's so much fullness as you age that that you're not you're not alone as you age and you can you can pass who you are and 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 what you believe and what you your passion and vision for the world on down through generations and it's just not it's just not you just out there cut off yeah the the question that we need to have is what kind of heritage do we leave behind what kind of impact do we want to see made on the world what what's going to be left besides perhaps a, a grave marker of us uh, there are some people that in God's providence have not been able to have children of their own, but they've been able to, to make an impact. But the ordinary circumstance, if we're able to have children and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, we leave a heritage behind us. You know, one of my great frustrations, um, it's come out numerous times in the shows, has been the pessimism of so much of evangelicalism, uh, a lot of it based on dispensationalism. A good friend of mine, his in-laws were horrified when he and his wife got married. Why would they marry when uh, the Great Tribulation was right around the corner? This was back in the 70s. And then that was nothing compared to, to having children why would you bring children into a world that's suffering and, and all these horrible things are going to happen? Why would you do that? I mean, they were just, they were furious. And now the youngest of those kids is in, you know, mid-twenties. But I think that we, we lose our optimism for the future and that we can make an impact that the future really does belong to our children and who's having them. Right. Now, you're a young woman, I mean, um, are you seeing this kind of desire among a lot of other women your age? More than you would expect, actually, but not the majority by any means. But I think that there's been, in certain circles, there's been a resurgence of interest in us thinking of ourselves as part of a bigger picture. And that's one problem that, that drives me crazy is so many people have this short-sightedness of you know, it's just me and it's my life. What am I going to accomplish in my however many decades? And that's it. Without this, just a longer view of history and how much history we're a part of and how much history, if the Lord tarries, may be yet to come and what, what our place is in that broader picture. I think there's some resurgence of interest in that. There needs to be more. I'm curious in terms of your opinion of, well, let me back up. Uh, I don't know how much you are familiar with this. A lot of people would see this as a Roman Catholic issue. They would see Protestants as, as not having these kind of positions, but they don't understand that historically Protestants were just as, as staunch in their views that children were to be sought as a great blessing, uh, if, if possible. As the Roman Catholics, they didn't argue in the same way the Catholics did, but Martin Luther uh, basically saw, described uh, contraception as 
the murder of potential persons. Mm -hmm. uh, the Senate of Dort equated it with uh, abortion. It said it would be basically like taking the, uh, the baby and ripping it from its mother's womb. Mm -hmm. And the heritage that we have as Protestants is that they saw themselves as the godly and they, they recognized that the ungodly would destroy themselves to a great extent. And so the pursuance of a godly seed was a, was a big theme historically in Protestantism. But it, it seems to have largely disappeared uh, in the 1970s and 80s and, and on to today. Are you, did you, now you went to uh, Wheaton College, which is a traditionally evangelical school. Did you mm -hmm. hear any of this kind of stuff at Wheaton? No, not that I recall. I can't really remember coming up at all in one way or another. As you have become more reformed in your convictions, you know, um, bringing things to the bar of God's Word, understanding the depth of, of God's Word and, and the historic understanding of it, I'm curious what your view is in terms of the dichotomy between the godly and the ungodly. Is, is that something you saw in evangelicalism? Is it something that you, you understand better now? Um, could you, could you? Yeah, I mean, when you were at Wheaton, did they ever talk about the godly and the ungodly in the same way that, say, like you see it in almost every psalm? Not that I remember, no. I mean, basically there were the, there were the Christians and the unconverted who right. were the mission field. Right. But the sense in which the scriptures talk about the ungodly uh, being like chaff and being destroyed and things like this. Um, that's not a theme that's, that's very prevalent in much of evangelicalism today, is it? No, I never, never heard too much of that. I mean, I'm sure in some circumstances, I'm sure people talk about it, but not really a lot in the circles I was in. Now, you know, you've, you've gained an affinity for singing psalms over the years. I have. Uh, 148 out of 150 psalms make some contrast between the godly and the ungodly. What, right. what do you make of that? It's important. <laughs> I mean, anything that comes up in the Bible is important. If it comes up once, it's important. But if it's such a recurrent theme, then it's, it's got to be foundational. You, you've got, you know, in the New Testament, you have the wheat and the tares. You have the sheep and the goats. You have this, this dichotomy and the raising up of a godly seed is something we see all through Scripture, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Now, um, we see in Scripture, like with the, the case of Rebecca, it's God who opens her womb. It's God who, who opens and closes the womb. Uh, we see it with uh, Rachel. Uh, we see it with Hannah. We see it with a whole host of, of biblical characters. And Barrenness is actually identified as a, as a curse in Hosea, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That Hosea basically calls down a curse of barrenness and a miscarrying womb. And yet contraception often is it's at, at best a barrenness. At worst, it's actually miscarriage, isn't it? I mean, obviously there, you have abortion, but there are, I don't want to get too technical and specific on things this evening, but a lot of women, I think, are, are surprised to find out that some f fairly common contraceptive methods are actually abortions. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've known people to, that were surprised by that and had no idea that that was the case. It's, it's not, there's, it's actually nothing to prevent conception. It just simply, uh, conception takes place, but the, uh, the fertilized egg is never allowed to actually implant. And um, I'm curious, besides time and nutrition, do you see anything that stands between us at the point of conception and now? Absolutely not. No. I'm told that, once again, as a man, I can have no opinion on abortion because that's a woman's issue and blah, 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 blah. Uh, as a woman, what's your view of abortion? I view it as murder. I mean, because as you just said, there is no qualitative difference from the point of conception to the point of birth to the point we're at now. There's, there's no other dividing line. That is a human being. I want to 
draw out some of the, the common arguments that are made against this. It, it amazes me. It, it shouldn't, but it, it never ceases to amaze me how virulent the arguments are against the idea that we should be seeking to have um, uh, children within normal bounds. Now that we're going to talk about, we're going to delicately talk about some boundaries there, but um, before we get into too much of the specifics, I want to go ahead and open up the phone lines. If you'd like to join in the conversation, we're talking about should we view children as a blessing? Should we hold to the old position that uh, blessed is the man whose, whose quiver is full of them? Or should we rethink all this in terms of uh, new insights on the environment, new theologies, and all these other things? Uh, we invite you to call in. Our phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Well, let's, let's, um, I didn't have a chance to talk to you too much. You're too young to remember the population bomb. Um, but in 1968, a, a book came out by Paul Ehrlich, and he essentially argues that if we have exponential population growth, if we have a steady rate of, of population growth, uh, we're going to we're going to outgrow our ability to feed people, and we're going to have massive starvation. And he predicted all kinds of dire consequences that generally didn't take place. He said, in the 1970s and 80s, people literally hundreds of millions of people would be starving to death. Uh, this has been answered by um, Paul Simon back in the 70s and 80s, um, who basically showed some of the fallacies of uh, Ehrlich's arguments and, and essentially made the point that each mouth brings two hands and a brain and that these kinds of, of doom and gloom things have been, these kinds of arguments have been made uh, all the way back to the 1700s with Robert Malthus. Um, this is where we get Malthusian, which is a cool term. Um, <laughs> This doom and gloom that the population is growing geometrically, our ability to feed them is growing arithmetically. Therefore, we're going to we're all going to die. Uh, to be really responsible, we need to stop having children. And this has been argued by um, people such as um, Ron Sider in Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. Uh, it's been argued. There's a professor at uh, University of Colorado, Denver, who says that one of the first things that we have to do is stop this population growth. Now, you've got five kids. You and your husband have literally multiplied. <clears throat> we have. Uh, what are your thoughts on these kinds of things? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a population expert. I, um, I'm extremely skeptical of the population scare. I... From what, from what I see in the demographics of America and Europe, we are not headed for a population boom. We are headed in the opposite direction as our society is getting top heavy with older people. People are not having children. We're going to be having fewer workers. I don't, I don't see us headed that way. But you know, also, these things are very complicated. And people, you know, all of us like to think we can we can really understand, you know, we can see how things are now and we can predict how it's going to go right down the line. These things are extremely complex and, you know, whether, whether I understand all the population issues or not, I still can come back and, and see where children are a blessing. We are commanded to be fruitful and multiply and are told that that is a blessing to us. Um, we can look at the world around us and we can we can be encouraged, or we can, you know, see, you know, see what's going on. But, but we just we have to come back to our foundation. Well, one of the things that strikes me is that God says in His Word that those who hate wisdom love death. Those who hate Him love death. And the ungodly seem to have a knack for destroying themselves. And so, to me, one of 
the ways, the greatest engine of church growth in all of history has been the marriage bed. Christians having children and raising them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We, we go out and we, we evangelize, we make disciples, we send out foreign missionaries, we try to establish churches, but it is Christians having Christians. And you can see how, um, you know, I, I think a study was done years ago of the descendants of uh, Jonathan Edwards, you know, great Puritan preacher. Of the 400 and some odd uh, descendants at that time of Jonathan Edwards, you had a host of ministers, college professors, uh, senators, I think a president, um, the politicians, I would be a little iffy on, but, but at any rate, I mean, you can see that, that God blessed his descendants. God, God is, was a God to him and to his seed after him, to a great extent. They did a similar survey of a man named Jukes who uh, was a horse thief, and he had 300 and some descendants and they were prostitutes and thieves and murderers, and um, there was a few, also a few politicians thrown <laughs> in there. But what kind of future do we want? And we see what the world brings. The world brings in this idea from China. You know, China says you get one child per couple, and if you get pregnant with another one, we'll, we'll kill it will force an abortion on you. But um, I want to flesh out some of these things. Um, we have with us Johnny from Tooele. Johnny, good to have you with us this evening. Hi. Yeah, I was uh, calling to comment on the population explosion, and I believe uh, I said that the blood in it is and uh, be fruitful and go out and multiply is what God said, and I believe, you know, uh, God is totally in control. Most definitely. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I, 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 I'm not endorsing her, but um, the, uh, Ann Coulter in her book Godless made a comment something along the lines that, um, you know, the liberals, um, favorite program is the one child policy in China. The, the historic Christian position is basically we multiply, we fill this earth, we uh, go and colonize Mars and you know it's, it's an optimistic view for the future because we have confidence that, that God is in control. And these guys have always underestimated that God provides. And you know I can go through all kinds of nightmarish scenarios that have been put, put forward before us. You know, the reality is uh, we do need to be good stewards. We do need to be planning for the future. Uh, and this is not something that we're commending to everybody. In fact, if people are in rebellion against God, uh, then, you know, they're, they're going to have a tendency not to seek kids. Uh, this is not something that we're saying everybody needs to be doing this, but we're saying that the Bible views children as a blessing. And I think too often we drink from the same water as, as the world and we, we imbibe this thinking that, well, that was the old way of thinking and now we need to be more enlightened and we need to think that the truly godly position is I'm only going to have one child. By what standard? Scriptures haven't changed. Um, I truly believe that. Just like a lot of uh, people don't believe, uh, you know, it's a feel. Uh, the Old Testament still stands. I mean, uh, God said, you know, I come to fulfill them, you know, not to, not to abolish them. You know, that's what it's all about. It's all about the Word of God. And God don't change His mind, and you know, and if you don't write one thing and then change His mind later, because I think God, God is, you know, forever God. Uh, we are not, so I totally agree with you. Well, thank you, Johnny. Um, come see us sometime. We're right around the point of the mountain there from you, uh, right there in Magna. Thanks for calling. Um, now, 
let, let's qualify a little bit here uh, because we've been giving some generalities. Uh, is it your understanding that if, if someone's life is in danger that they're under the obligation to have um, children to the point that it kills them or, or, or puts them in, in physical danger? No. But I, no, but, I wouldn't say that. But I thought you were supposed to have a towel wrapped around your head and be um, shouting, you know, uh, Allah Akbar or something like that with those kind of ideas, yeah, right? Not today, no. <laughs> <laughs> not ever, you're, sorry. You're, you're not some kind of zealot, huh? <laughs> I don't think of myself so. I, I, I thought from, from what the world says that you're supposed to be rabid and uh, humorless and, you know, I mean, broodmarish, uh, like the guy said in, in his comments. Let's qualify this. Um, this is the ideal. In Christian liberty, there are things that people can, you know, because of, of health, because of other circumstances, sometimes they need they need to be wise in terms of what they're doing. I mean, if if a if a husband becomes debilitated to where he cannot provide for his family, that's um, having more children may not be a, a good situation. Um, but, and, and the Lord has provided. Um, there are natural means of, of avoiding conception um, in terms of timing and things like this. Um, the, the, the Catholic Church promotes uh, the rhythm method, which I don't want to get into <laughs> specifics of. I, won't, I don't want to make you blush tonight, but anyway. Um, but I think we have to, to go back and reevaluate what is our view of a Christian home? What is our view of the family? Do we view God as a covenanting God and that our children are especially blessed? Is that, do, you, do you presume that all your children are going to be saved? No. no you mean you no. actually tell them they need to repent and believe? I do. We, we had a good conversation about that this morning. We were sometimes in school, we'll pick up the newspaper and we read about, about the little girl who was killed the other day um, up in, or down in Orem, I think it was. And I just wanted them, I didn't want to, you know, scare them or anything, but I wanted to tell them, you know, you never know. You just never know. And you need to, you need to think about these things and you need to be, you need to be examining yourself and, you know, being, being sure that you, that you love Jesus and that you are repentant. Yeah, you actually go back through the 19th century um, books for children and the reality of death was all around them. And so a lot of the stories dealt with unexpected death. Uh, children, you know, children died um, very often uh, 150 years ago. I mean, it was, it, it's the exception now. I mean, it, it, the young woman down in uh, Orem, you know, a teenage girl takes her mother's car and, and, and runs her over. Um, that's a different circumstance than 150 years ago. You know, you'd have yellow fever come through, you'd have all kinds of other things right. come through. And um, those books are, are really sobering in terms of warning children, be prepared. I think sometimes we neglect that um, too often these days. So you believe that your children uh, need to repent and believe, but you also have confidence that God is a God to you and to your children? Oh, yes. Um, I mean, we, we, are, we assume that they're in the covenant, you know, unless, unless they, you know, at some point down the road made that clear that they weren't. We assume that they are. And within that context, we, we teach them, you know, what they need to know to be part of the covenant. Along with telling them to repent and believe mm -hmm. yeah. as well. And so they may, they may be like John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit from their mother's womb. They may be an adult convert. Um, who knows how the Lord will deal with them. But it's, to me, I've heard the statement made by a number of folks over the years, some of them kind of wacky, but it's a true statement nonetheless. The future belongs to those who will take it. My, one of my great frustrations um, in dealing with people in this generation is we tend to have very little sense of history. 
either of what lies behind or what lies ahead. We live for the moment. It's about me feeling good. It's about you know my uh, personal growth. My person. You know, it's very self-centered. Mm -hmm. And the, the dispensationalism has given people the excuse to think, well, we must be in the last generation. Well, dispensationalism has been telling us that for 107. Excuse me, 180 years now. Right. For 180 years, we've been in the last generation. And, you know, the, these folks that I was telling you about that were horrified that they had grandchildren, they were expecting the rapture no later than 1981. And here we are 29 years later. Right. You weren't even born yet. Or, yeah, you were. I was. Okay. 1981 doesn't seem quite so long ago to me. But. I won't say when, but I was. <laughs> if you'd like to join in the conversation, our phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. We're talking about a biblical view of children. How do we lay the foundations for the future? How do we uh, claim the future for Christ? I, it is my belief that one of the things that we need to do is to take seriously that it is a blessing from God to have children, to raise them in nurture and admonition of the Lord, recognize this is how the Lord has grown His church through the ages. And it has been the number one means of church growth in all of, of those times. I think that we have so put our focus on the... Um, winning of the unbeliever, that we have forsaken the discipling of our children. And we, and as a consequence, the church is shrinking dramatically. I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to you a little bit. Um, I've mentioned on the air before, uh, Ann Douglas wrote a book called The Feminization of American Culture. Uh, Ann Douglas, to my knowledge, is no Orthodox Christian at all. But she's a very good writer, a very good historian. And she, she talks about the shifting views in the 19th century, that at the beginning of the 19th century, the Christian home was viewed as um, one to be led by the father, that, the, that Christian nurture of children involved a great deal of uh, transmitting of knowledge. And so they needed, uh, you know, it was a story. I mean, it's, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, laying out uh, creation, fall, redemption, all these various things. And that conveying this knowledge needed the, the firm but loving hand of the Father. And so you had Bible, uh, you know, the, the picture of the Christian home was the, the family gathered around the table, the father at the head uh, with the Bible open and the mother and the children uh, attentively, you know, paying attention to the, to the reading of God's Word. She says that a fundamental shift took place, that rather than seeing children as, sin, as sinners, um, you know, that they were, as Jonathan Edwards called them, little vipers in covenant diapers. So they were sinners, and yet they were in the, you know, they were covenant children. And so they were blessed by God, and yet they were, they were born sinners. Instead of having that sort of view, they began to have this much more sentimental view of children. And instead of seeing uh, Christianity as, a, as involving fundamentally a revelation of, of God, who He is and what He's done, they saw it as the inculcation of attitudes. And that children were naturally innocent and they just, they didn't need the firm hand of the father, they needed the gentle wooing of the mother. And that this has just totally remade um, the Christian home by the uh, last quarter of, of the 19th century. The picture of the Christian home no longer gathered around the table, but the children gathered around the organ with the mother playing and, e and the father either absent or singing along. Do you see that kind of paradigm shift in our day? Um, that, that what many of us have seen as the traditional Christian home isn't really biblical and needs to be rethought. 
I think so. I think in a lot of circles, um, the husband's headship of the family is just, it's just fallen by the wayside. It became unpopular and now it's in a lot of places largely forgotten. Not everywhere, but in a lot of places it's forgotten. And to, to have the biblical structure of the home where, where the husband is the head of the house and um, my husband and I are kind of Trekkies and he always refers to me as his first <laughs> officer. <laughs> And it's a good picture. It's goofy, but it's a good picture because, you know, he's the captain, he's in charge. But I'm not, you know, I'm not some little ensign. I'm I'm the first officer. I'm I'm the next in command and my my job is, you know, I'm the manager and I'm overseeing everything under him and just, anyway. Just don't pull any counsel or Troy things. No, no. She, no, she was please. an earhead. But anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm showing my geek status here. We have with us Stan. Um, from uh, North Ogden. Good to have you with us, Stan. Hello, how are you? Doing well, thanks. Um, I called to comment because I love children and I believe that children need a chance to come up, be raised in a loving home and enjoy a loving mother and father. And that we don't know what child may be the next great inventor or prophet or anyone may be bringing great wealth to this world as far as spiritual wealth sent back down from heaven direct. And God loves all children, for he created all. And I'm sure if everybody took the time to think about it, the, the next generation may be the wealthiest, wealthiest generation, the most spiritual and we should love every one of them and bring them into our homes and, and give them everything that they need and bring them up right. Just like everybody wants to make their computers do everything they want and uh, buy all the software and everything. Children need everything, especially love. And so they may bring forth a great spirit into the world. The guys down in Chile that were lost in that hellish hole that was brought forth out of that hole brought that whole country together in a wealth. And their children are the most blessed. And they should, and the whole world should learn a big lesson of that. Everybody is God's children, and no one should be rejected. And I feel sorry for the people in China, because who knows what child that they destroy may have been the child that brings them hope. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Stan. I would have a few qualifiers in there I won't take time to go through, but I appreciate your phone call. You know, there's so much talk about how China is going to do this and do that. Um, I, I realize this is a bit of a contrarian's view, but honestly, I mean, I, the Lord may use China to chastise uh, the rest of the world, but I'm not really all that worried about China because I don't think that God's going to bless them slaughtering their children. Uh, we, we see what happens with um, the Canaanites, how they sacrifice their children to Moloch. Well, at least they were thought they were worshiping a god. The state's saying that it's doing it for convenience. And eventually, after 400, 400 years after Abraham, the, um, the wickedness of the Amorites was full, and the land vomited them out. And I think they are calling down God's judgment upon themselves. Of course, so are we as a nation. We slaughter our children. Um, and so I'm, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying that we're going to be immune. I think we're under God's judgment right now. Um, just as a qualifier, we're going to take another phone call in here in just a second. But um, just because someone's not bound to do something doesn't mean that it's not commended. Remember, uh, Rachel desperately wanted another child and died in the process of having Benjamin and is commended for that. 
So um, anyway, it's just something that I think we, 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 we drink too much from the spirit of the age sometimes and we treat children as if they're pets rather than if they are a blessing from God that we're entrusted with their nurture and admonition. We have with us Roland uh, from Provo. Roland, good to have you with us. Roland? Are you, I, am I on? Yes, you're on the air. Oh. Uh, Jason, uh, I, uh, I agree with everything you said here in, in, in the Christian sense, but I want to make a social, a social comment about the children. Uh, having children is a private affair. It, parents should make sure that whenever they have children, they are able to provide for them. I understand. You need to turn your TV down. Uh, you're getting an echo. So, uh, uh, the, thing, the, the, the problem nowadays is the people that have many children that they can't afford, they expect society to pay for it. I, I don't want to pay for somebody else's lovemaking. That's their problem. And I think people ought to make sure that what they produce, they can provide for. Understood. Now you look, you look in China, or you look in, in India, and in Africa, what children are produced with, in total disregard of, of any responsibility. That is not good. Uh, God doesn't want that either. My second comment is about the lady, uh, there's a, uh, a homeschooler. I think homeschooling is a subculture that is negative for our society because they are they are held by, by intelligent uh, parents. They think they can give more to their children than the rest of society. And admittedly, our education system is, is, uh, is not educated. But these children, they grow up in a, in a different society. They become a subculture. They, I, we have one in the neighborhood. These children, they just crave to crave to be uh, with, with the rest of the uh, children, but they never get the real chance. So uh, I think this young lady is too young uh, to uh, to uh, understand the full uh, 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 consequence of, of this movement. This is not good for our society. We, we ought to grow together and not apart. And the homeschooling is, is a subculture that is not doing good for society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rowan. Um, I'll, I'll let you chime in on this as well, but in, in my view, obviously there are some nuts and flakes out there who homeschool because they're weird and they want their children to be weird. At the same time, um, I'm glad we homeschool our children as well, and I'm thrilled that they are not part of the mainstream culture uh, with Paris Hilton and Britney Spears and uh, slaves to every fashion and fad that comes through. Um, our oldest, I wouldn't have brought this up if homeschooling hadn't been criticized here, and, and I'll qualify it. I mean, it, homeschooling can be a magnet for every nut and flake under the sun, and yet at the same time, uh, it is, uh, it's not the state who has the rights to our children, it's us and we're to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm not going to send my children to a school to be indoctrinated, to be um, slaves to the state. Uh, our oldest, you know, the Lord blessed in spite of our multitude of failings. Our oldest uh, is 17, uh, just turned 17. Uh, he started early enrollment through Salt Lake Community College. He's tested out of his freshman year entirely. He's at the top of his class in Calculus 1, Chemistry 1, uh, Biology 1. He's uh, taking some other classes as well. He's hoping to go to the U and enter the um, medical engineering program and then go to medical school. Uh, his ACTs are among the best in the nation. Uh, I wouldn't have, and he's a, he's a godly, serious young man. I, what, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, obviously, I, I disagree that homeschooling is bad for our society. I think it's wonderful for our society. 
um, as Christians, you know, we're, we are to be in the world and not of it. And <clears throat> I don't think the best approach to that is to send our children to day in, day out, receive an education that is godless. The knowledge of God is the beginning of wisdom. How can you have any education? How can you understand um, anything, science, history, anything, without understanding that God is at the center of it? I, I don't see any way around that problem. And I know, I know a lot of, of homeschooling families and homeschooling kids who are very well-adjusted members of society. When they grow up, they, we don't, there are, as you said, there are crazy homeschooling families. There's crazy families in every situation. Most homeschoolers don't sit inside their four walls every day. You know, we get out, we do things, we interact with all different kinds of people in all different kinds of situations. And it's wonderful for the kids to learn how to really be a part of the real world that's out there and not just learn how to be a part of a classroom. It's a much, much broader education. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. I mean, the, there is no neutrality. And when you look at the public school system, they're trying to inculcate, uh, no longer is it simply tolerance, but it is acceptance and affirmation of every aberrant lifestyle imaginable. They want to teach your children that what was considered perverse and unspeakable a generation ago is not something that they not only are going to be dealing with in the world, but it's something that they need to affirm, that this is good for this person. They drive home to them this, this idea that there, there is no absolute basis of morality, and it, it's horrific. And you look, the public school systems, are racked with, with all kinds of incompetence, disrespect. Uh, we, we see, you know, the longer, our American students actually start off fairly high in comparison with the world when they first go into public schools. The longer they stay in public schools, the lower they go. And I, I think the whole idea needs to be rethought. It is not natural to create these artificial peer groups that they cr you create a subculture of youth. Mm -hmm. I mean, before we had public schools, I mean, the original public schools were one-room schoolhouses where everyone was mixed together. You didn't have so much this subculture of youth with its own music, its own uh, movies, its own everything, clothing and everything. Children's primary uh, peer group, the, the, the group they identified with, was their family. Right. And it's the destruction of the family. I mean, we did a thing on this with Hitler. Uh, Hitler wanted to destroy the family to promote the state. And he knew that public education was the uh, primary means of that. And he told people who opposed him, said, you're going to pass away, but we'll have your children, basically. Uh, we're going to squeeze in one quick call. Uh, Galen, you have, um, you have about 30 seconds. Okay. Make it quick. Oh, Pastor Wallace, it's good to talk to you. Uh, I'm a Latter-day Saint, and I find this discussion tonight so very interesting because from an ultimate point of view, here we are talking about the difference between the individual as being supreme in eternity or the family unit. And since uh, the historic Christianity has said that the family will cease to exist after death, I find it, uh, well, not disturbing, but I find it kind of uh, interesting that they would still emphasize family life as far as mortality was concerned. But since uh, the individual is supreme and will be after death, uh, then uh, an individual will put in a lot of effort to develop a family. Uh, it seems to me that uh, that effort seems to be kind of wasted as far as mortality is concerned. So this discussion to me is very important in terms of uh, uh, seeing uh, as historic Christianity says that the individual is supreme to the family unit and Galen, that we're might almost be out one of time. the major reasons we have this kind of problem. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, Galen? I'll, I'll put it bluntly. Uh, we've only got, we've got less than two minutes left, so I'm going to make it quick. Um, I, 
stand by what I've said before that uh, the Latter-day Saint position presents a different God and a different gospel than the one in the scriptures. That being said, there are some areas where uh, you put us to shame in terms of there are so many evangelicals who don't look to the Bible and recognize things that Latter-day Saints do. Uh, you have a visible church when a lot of your critics don't. You have a call to holiness. You have a host of other things. You value the family. That doesn't mean you make an idol of it. It doesn't mean that it becomes a way to godhood. But um, anyway, we're almost out of time. I'd like to thank uh, Desiree Housen for being kind enough to join us this evening. Uh, Desiree, great to have you with us. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, we are sponsored by Christ Presbyterian Church, of which I am the pastor. We are a historic Bible-believing Presbyterian Church. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna here in the Salt Lake Valley. We have a sister congregation, Berean Presbyterian Church, that meets at 9 a.m. at 3350 Harrison Boulevard in Ogden. And we have a mission work down at American Fork on Sunday afternoons. We believe that we are uh, sinners saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. We believe the Bible is our only infallible rule of faith and practice. We try to stress biblical worship and, uh, and, and biblical preaching as well. Until next time, we wish you the Lord's blessing and hope to join you again here next week. Until then, good night. <laughs>